call the hearing to order. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, all Americans deserve access to affordable, patient-centered health care. Unfortunately, the fight to achieve this worthy goal has become politicized to the point where it's perilous to even acknowledge the shortcomings of our current Byzantine system. There are bipartisan solutions to this problem, and today we'll be, we will be discussing one of those. That's why I'm excited to convene today's hearing titled The Potential for Health Savings Accounts to Engage Patients and Bend the Health Care Cost Curve. When does a patient decide that a common cold isn't worth the expense of a doctor's visit? Or whether it would be worth saving dollars by going to a general practitioner who could easily treat an ailment rather than a pricey specialist? Patients would have a hard time answering these questions because the actual cost of care remains obscured until long after services are rendered. Even after patients receive an explanation of benefits, the true cost is obscured by what providers charged and what the government or insurers decided they would pay for a service. This lack of transparency has contributed to rising health costs, which ultimately leads, leads to more affordable insurance and even less satisfaction with the health care system. Yet in the current environment, Consumers and providers alike are divorced from the true cost of care. As the economist Milton Friedman once said, nobody spends somebody else's money as wisely or as frugally as he spends his own. Americans are excellent comparison shoppers. Television, direct mail marketing, billboards, and storefronts all appeal to consumers' senses of value for price when making important choices for themselves and their families. An important part of everyday life is making decisions based on personal preferences, needs, and of course, cost. And it is for this reason that competition thrives among auto manufacturers, food producers, and home builders to deliver safe, healthy, and long-lasting products that people can afford. We all acknowledge that American health care and health insurance are very expensive. And in today's hearing, we will investigate how health savings accounts, or HSAs, allow Americans to lower the cost of health care by drawing on an important idea, an area of their expertise, <coughs> and that's themselves. HSAs have delivered great benefits, and there may be even more to come if <coughs> lawmakers strengthen HSAs hold in the marketplace. I believe they can broaden access to quality medical care, increase patient choice, and improve health for all Americans. It is for this reason that I joined with Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch to enhance both health savings accounts and flexible spending accounts to give hardworking Americans more choice and control when it comes to their health care decisions. According to one estimate, if half of employer-sponsored insurance incorporated HSAs, national savings and health care spending can total $57 billion annually. So how do they work? An HSA is a tax-exempt account that is set up to pay or reimburse certain medical expenses incurred while, covering, uh, while covered by the kinds of high deductive health care plans many Americans have today. Employees and employers contribute these funds pre-tax, and the money that has gone unused can roll over year to year, and consumers continue to have access to the money even if they change employers or leave the workforce. So it's portable. And since the creation of HSAs in 2003, the number of people who have an HSA has risen dramatically. In 2005, roughly 1 million people were enrolled, and today 22 million people have HSAs. Americans clearly see the benefit of directing their own health dollars towards their own health care needs and expenses. Yeah, my own home state of Minnesota has the third highest enrollment in HSAs in the country with nearly 1.2 million enrollees. And a 2016 study of large employers uh, that offered consumer-directed health plans, uh, CDHPs, in the form of a high-deductible health plan with HSAs found significant long-term cost reduction and no evidence of worth health outcomes. In recent years, the state of Indiana implemented an HSA structure both in its Medicaid program and in insurance offered to state employees. Then Governor Daniels noted that this consumer-driven approach resulted in savings and customer satisfaction. In 2010, state employees who enrolled were expected to save more than $8 million compared to their coworkers in the traditional health care alternative. Ultimately, the HSA is a vital tool that helps improve our health care system, even for those who don't have an HSA. By putting consumers directly in charge of their health care, the healthcare sector becomes more consumer conscious. As in many areas of our economy, the answer usually lies in the wisdom of the American people. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel of witnesses today how HSAs and the idea of consumer driven healthcare can help improve the affordability of healthcare. But before I introduce them, I now recognize the ranking member, Senator Heinrich, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Paulson. I am looking forward to today's discussion on health savings accounts. 
These tax-free accounts play a constructive role for some consumers to cover health care costs. HSAs are particularly helpful for those earning more than $100,000 who are already saving for retirement and have less trouble covering their monthly bills and student loan payments. But HSAs do little to bend the so-called health care cost curve. This is the fundamental problem that we must focus on. How do we provide top quality care while reducing our overall national health care spending and lowering consumers' out-of-pocket costs? But HSA seem to generate the most savings through cost shifting, not cost saving. Here, employers pay less by offering skimpier plans coupled with an HSA. But employees shoulder a greater share of costs, the financial risks of getting sick, as well as yet another obstacle to navigate between themselves and their actual health care. And this is happening at the exact time when wages remain stubbornly stagnant and more and more families are struggling to get ahead. But my chief concern is this. Part of the reason that we're here today is that our Republican colleagues seem to be gearing up for yet another attempt to repeal the ACA. If the new proposal is anything like the last, we can expect it to gut Medicaid, drop millions from coverage, take away comprehensive coverage, and further hike premiums. Central to the Republican vision has been to move more and more consumers to high deductible plans, which have lower premiums, but ask consumers to pay more for doctor visits and services before the health plan covers care. If paired with an HSA, a family can put aside up to $6,900 tax-free to use for qualified health expenditures. The investments in the HSAs grow tax-free. The thinking behind the HSAs is that if people put aside their money for their health care, they will spend it more wisely and, on average, spend less. They will have, as they say, skin in the game. The problem, though, is that without knowing what we're paying for and how much we're paying, without transparency, consumers simply do not have the tools that they need to make rational decisions about cost. And HSAs are unable to help with this problem. What we do know is that HSAs sometimes encourage people to forego needed care which is the main way that they save money. If you need chemotherapy to treat your breast cancer, but you've underfunded your HSA and have a $2,700 <coughs> deductible, what happens? If your child gets sick, will you take her to the doctor or keep her at home based on how much of your deductible you've paid down? If you or a loved one is grappling with an opioid addiction, a reality for far too many across the country and in New Mexico, Will an HSA cover your treatment? Can someone battling addiction or managing a serious mental health issue make enough money to save into an HSA in the first place? These are important questions. No matter where you live, what you do for a living, or what party you belong to, these questions are at the heart of our health care conversation. I'm worried that HSAs, an idea that has merit for uh, some well-off consumers, are being twisted into a quick fix that will only exacerbate the challenges in New Mexico, such as our ongoing fight against the opioid epidemic. I am all for working together on real solutions to making needed improvements in our healthcare system, improvements that will reduce costs on consumers, increase price transparency so that consumers can make informed decisions, and prevent surprise medical bills, as well as reduce the overall cost of health care in our country. But focusing on HSAs while avoiding an honest conversation about the key drivers of health care costs could have real negative impacts on real people who are simply trying to manage an illness or care for a sick loved one. We must focus on actions that can actually bend the cost curve, like investing in preventative care, using the government's purchasing power to lower drug prices, and paying for quality of care rather than quantity. And we have to focus on making things simpler for families. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today and to hearing their perspectives on how we can bring down health care costs for families. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. And with that, we will begin by introducing our witnesses. Uh, first, we have Dr. Scott W. Atlas, who is the, is the David and Joan Tretel Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover. 
Dr. Atlas has published more than 120 journal articles. Two recent books include Restoring Quality Health Care, a six-point plan for comprehensive reform at lower cost, and also In Excellent Health, Setting the Record Straight on America's Health Care System. Dr. Atlas has been published or interviewed by The Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, CNN, Fox News, the PBS NewsHour, and many others. As Professor in Chief of Neuroradiology at Stanford University Medical Center, he has trained more than 100 neuroradiology fellows. Dr. Atlas received a BS degree in biology from the University of Illinois in Urbana, Champaign, and an MD from the University of Chicago School of Medicine. Also with us is Kevin McKechnie, joined uh, America's Bankers Association back in 2001. He's currently the executive director of the HSA Council and a senior vice president. Mr. McKechnie is also a principal in HSA Holdings, which provides healthcare financing expertise to several governments around the world. Previously, he served for four years as government relations representative for Marsh and McLennan. Mr. McKechnie also served as director of government relations for international financial services and legislative assistant for former Representative William Dannemeyer of California. Mr. McKechnie has a BA in history and political science from York University in Toronto, Canada, and pursued graduate studies in American history at American University. Tracy Watts is a senior partner in Mercer's Washington, D.C. office and is on the policy board of directors for the American Benefits Council. A consultant with Mercer for 30 years, Ms. Watts specializes in healthcare cost management, assisting employers in the design, evaluation, and ongoing management of health and group benefit plans for active and retired employees. As a spokesperson for Mercer, she has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Money Magazine, USA Today, and many others. Ms. Watts is a graduate of Texas Christian University. And also with us today is Dr. Kavita Patel, who is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, as well as a practicing primary care internist at John Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Patel served in the Obama administration as Director of Policy for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Engagement. As a senior aide to Valerie Jarrett, Dr. Patel played a critical role in policy development and evaluation of policy initiatives connected to health reform, financial regulatory reform, and economic recovery issues. Dr. Patel also served and worked as a deputy staff director on health for the late Senator Edward Kennedy, uh, being in this room, as she mentioned to me a little earlier. She earned her medical degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center and her master's in public health from the University of California, Los Angeles. And with that, we will welcome each of you to the hearing today, and uh, we'll, we'll begin by recognizing you, Dr. Atlas, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation and opportunity to speak today uh, about health care reform, specifically about the role of health savings accounts. It's in the context of overall health care reform that I will discuss the importance of HSAs, including the rationale for incentivizing their use and for strategically reforming them to leverage their impact on broadening access to quality medical care, increasing patient choice, and improving health for all Americans. The critical concept here is that reducing the cost of medical care itself is the most effective pathway to broader access to quality care and lower insurance premiums, and ultimately, of course, better health. Instead, the Affordable Care Act and most post-ACA ideas continue to stress making insurance more affordable, mainly through refundable tax credits or other subsidies. But insurance premiums are secondary and historically chiefly reflect two factors, mainly the cost of medical care, accounting for the majority, and the regulatory environment. Therefore, strategies to subsidize premiums artificially prop up insurance coverage that typically has minimized out-of-pocket payment. This is directly counterproductive because it shields medical care providers from competing on price. Two key points are essential to clarify from the start. Number one, the HSA is a vital and highly effective proven tool to broaden access to affordable, high-quality health care for all Americans, even those without HSAs. It does so by putting consumers directly in charge of buying their own health care, and better than tax deductions, HSAs uniquely incentivize savings. The fundamental purpose of an HSA is not simply to provide a tax-sheltered benefit for individuals in order to cushion the blow of high health care expenses. Two, the HSA is not an isolated, independent component of the health care system. Reforms to maximize their positive impact for consumers are tied to other reforms. 
To broaden access to affordable, high-quality health care for all Americans, there are three fundamental steps that must occur and all directly relate to HSA reforms. One, patients must be strongly incentivized to consider medical care prices and simultaneously equipped with the tools to do so. This is accomplished through universally available, large, liberalized, and transferable HSAs in conjunction with lower cost, higher deductible insurance. The key question is, is it realistic to suggest that patients could even consider price? Among privately insured adults under 65, almost 60% of all health expenditures is for elective outpatient care. Even in the elderly, almost 40% of expenses are for outpatient care. Outpatient services dominate America's health care spending, and these are amenable to price-conscious purchasing. To fully leverage the impact of HSAs, it's important to position more patients as paying directly. Despite the ACA's regulatory attempt to shift consumers to more comprehensive, what I call bloated coverage, a shift toward high deductible plans with HSAs has continued. Indeed, by increasingly choosing HSAs when given the opportunity, Americans are approving their value. HSAs with high deductible coverage have proven to reduce health care prices. Spending reductions average 15% per year and increase with the level of deductible and when paired with HSAs. Adding HSAs to high deductible plans correlates to 50% to double the savings of high deductible plans alone. Downward pressure on health care prices from doctors competing for patients who paid directly for care has been demonstrated by procedures originally not covered by insurance, like LASIK corrective eye surgery or MR and CT screening. Data from MRI and outpatient surgery, covered care, confirms that when patients are motivated to compare prices, prices come down significantly. And this reduces prices for all healthcare consumers, not just HSA holders. The issue is not whether HSAs are effective in making a more healthcare affordable. It's how to mac maximize their adoption and fully leverage them. All HSAs should be fully owned and controlled by individuals. Restrictions on full HSA participation by seniors on Medicare should be abolished. Given that seniors are the biggest users of health care, it's critical to have them exerting downward pressure on health care prices. HSA limits should be expanded and uses should be eased, including for the expenses of the HSA account holders' elderly parents. And the list of allowable services and products should be expanded. They should be delinked from specific insurance deductibles. HSAs have also been a valuable vehicle for effective wellness programs. The ACA limited the financial incentives for employers, including deposits into HSAs. That should be abolished. The second big point is introduce the right incentives into the tax code to maximize the use and benefit of HSAs. In my belief is the tax code should cap the amounts of deductions or income exclusions if they're maintained, but it should limit those deductions or exclusions to two categories of expenses, HSA contributions and the amount of premiums for catastrophic coverage. To, to have tax deductions for all health care expending is counterproductive. It gives an incentive to spend more on health care. Three, strategically increase the supply of medical care to stimulate competition and increase choices. In large part, this means removing archaic anti-consumer barriers to competition among doctors, other medical care providers, healthcare technology, and drugs. In conclusion, in other countries, governments hold down health care costs mainly by limiting the use of medical care, drugs, and technology through its power over patients and doctors, often as single payer. And those countries get the expected results when looking at the actual data, long waits, and worse medical outcomes than the United States, particularly for their poor citizens who are the only ones unable to circumvent those systems. We should consider a different approach, creating appropriate incentives and eliminating harmful regulations so that prices of care come down and high quality care is affordable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKechnie. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Heinrich, members of the committee. I appreciate you having this hearing today. I'd like to request that my written testimony appear in the records if read. That's all right, Mr. Chairman. I founded the Council in 2004, the hope of accelerating adoption velocity of HSAs and the qualified insurance that goes with them. And we've succeeded. According to Devonier Research in Minneapolis, there are now more than 22 million accounts containing about $54 billion to pay for the future health care needs of about 30 million Americans, we think that's the number as of about January of this year in 2018, and that's an extrapolation to be entirely candid. Let me start with an observation from some of your former colleagues. 
So far, most of the proposals before Congress attempt to deal with access but do not adequately address the more important factor, cost control. We have introduced legislation that would give consumers an incentive to monitor spending carefully because to do otherwise would be wasting their own money. So says United States Senators Sam Nunn, John Bro, Tom Daschle, David Boren, Richard Luger, and Dan Coates on September 18, 1992. A bipartisan group, they were obviously ahead of their time and I suggest on to something. HSAs are the only health insurance plans in America that allow their owners to save for the future. Every other plan, even the ones a lot of health advocates call good insurance, start their participants off at the beginning of the year with nothing in the bank to satisfy out-of-pocket expenses. HSAs allow their owners to pay for routine care with tax-exempt dollars rather than after-tax dollars. And the Kaiser Family Foundation says the average deductible for single coverage in a small firm last year was $2,120. An important consumer question is how to satisfy that deductible with pre-tax dollars from your HSA or after-tax dollars from your wallet. Fidelity Investments reports that a 65-year-old couple would need $275,000 just to pay for the health expenses Medicare doesn't cover in retirement. I'm quite sure none of you are under the impression that our pension system is overfunded. HSAs can be a useful public policy tool to address that problem, too. My good friend Jody Deedle, Compliance Officer for WageWorks, testified yesterday before your colleagues in the House Ways and Means Committee that the median household income for an HSA account holder, according to their data, is only $57,060. Our anecdotal data of six companies just like WageWorks lowers that to $53,000. Additionally, most HSA owners, 77% in fact, were born after 1965. Only 22% are baby boomers, which is to say people at the height of their income potential. Devonier says the average HSA, HSA balance is a little more than $2,000, and that 78% of account holders have less than that in their account. Accordingly, I conclude these accounts are used for their intended purpose, which is paying for routine health care expenses by Americans of mostly modest income, comprised mostly of the three generations that follow the baby boomers, Generation Z, Millennials, and Gen Xers. I'm here today on their behalf to ask for your help. While HSAs are one important tool for managing costs, they need improvement. Uh, you can't have an HSA and be enrolled in Medicare or a traditional health plan. You can't take Social Security benefits because that automatically enrolls you in Part A. You can't have access to TRICARE or Indian Health Services or Veterans Administration benefits. You can't be covered by a medical FSA, and you can't have access to uh, retail medical clinics or telemedicine at no cost. Accordingly, HSA owners would like more flexibility. HSA should be able to cover more value-based services like direct primary care, expenses associated with chronic disease management, and telemedicine services. There are bipartisan bills in both houses of Congress, several supported by you and your colleagues, Mr. Chairman, that would allow these services in an HSA, and the Council strongly supports all of them. We also support allowing plans with an actuarial value of up to 80% to be considered HSA qualified, so we don't have to come and petition Congress or the IRS to achieve plan flexibility. As long as you had a plan that was below 80%, you'd be able to offer whatever services made that bucket full. Uh, if we're agreed that HSA should be more flexible, we further suggest allowing an increase in allowable contributions up to the out-of-pocket maximum in order to help people pay for these additional services or at least have the potential to cover their entire out-of-pocket risk with tax-exempt funds. We also want to allow seniors who choose to keep working and are covered by an employer-sponsored HSA plan to enroll in Medicare and still be HSA eligible. The President has gone further and proposed allowing HSAs in the Medicare Advantage program we agree with them. We agree with them in any event, know that this subject merits further uh, discussion. Medicaid should be broadened so that the successful example of Indiana's HIP 2.0 pro program can be expanded if a state so chooses. Vice President Pence, then Governor Pence, accomplished by federal waiver what we think states should have a right to do if they want. Now, I don't think HSAs can solve every problem, to your point, Ranking Member Heinrich but at least they have all the incentives in the right place. They let people save for the future. It's very important. They promote transparency in pricing, existing, exerting downward pressure on costs, and they respect well-known and proven insurance principles. I think more Americans should have access to HSAs, 
and recommend the legislative proposals pending before Congress be quickly enacted. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Ms. Watts. You are recognized for five minutes as well. Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to meet with you to discuss the critical role of health savings accounts in making health care more affordable. My name is Tracy Watts. I'm a senior partner at Mercer, and I'm testifying today on behalf of Mercer and the American Benefits Council, where I serve on their policy board of directors. I have more than 30 years of experience helping Fortune 500 employers develop innovative strategies to control their health care costs. Mercer is a business unit of Marsh and McLennan Companies. The businesses of MMC include Mercer, Oliver Wyman, Marsh and McLennan Agency. We employ 25,000 colleagues in the U.S., including more than 350 in your district, Mr. Chairman Paulson. The American Benefits Council is a public policy organization that represents Fortune 500 companies, and collectively, the Council's members either sponsor directly or provide services to retirement and health plans covering more than 100 million Americans. So I'd like to begin my testimony by highlighting some relevant findings from Mercer's National Survey of Employer-Sponsored Health Plans. The survey includes responses from 2,500 employers, and it's the oldest, longest, and most comprehensive survey of its kind. The results can be projected to any size employer population in the U.S. Our survey shows that an increasing number of American workers and their families enrolled in Consumer Directed Plans, or CDHPs. Um, and on page three of the PowerPoint attachment to my written testimony, you'll see about 34% of American workers employed by large companies, those with 500 or more employees, enrolled in a CDHP. Since 2009, the enrollment in CDHP plans has increased an astounding 325%. In addition to increased reliance on consumer-directed plans by American workers, if you turn to page four, you'll see that HSA-eligible plans cost 20% less than PPO plans in general, and they're 6% less costly than PPO plans with deductibles over $1,000. It's important to note that the success of HSA-eligible plans in reducing plan costs is one of the few strategies proven to help bend the curve and in turn help manage premium costs for employees. A driving force behind growth in the HSA eligible plans is the threat of the 40% Cadillac tax, now delayed to 2022, and we thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Senator Heinrich, for your leadership in working to repeal the tax. Next, I'd like to share an example of how we help clients analyze and evaluate their health plan performance. And this particular example shows the positive impact of HSA eligible plans on both cost and health risk. In this example, the employer has sponsored an HSA-eligible CDHP plan alongside a PPO plan for more than three years. And on page eight, you'll see that we matched enrollees in the PPO plan to enrollees in the CDHP option who shared the same demographic and risk profiles at the start of the three-year comparative period. There were approximately 13,000 plan members in each of the comparison groups, so it is a, it is a good sample size. When we looked at how the participants in each plan option used their medical services over the three-year period, it was quite similar across the two groups. There was basically no difference in the use of preventive screenings and annual physicals. The CDHP plan did have lower utilization of the emergency room, of office visits, and prescriptions. However, the day supply for the prescriptions was actually higher for CDHP members, which could mean better utilization of mail order benefits and better compliance with their prescribed therapies. The most interesting finding, though, from this study is shown on page 12, where we look at health risk over the three-year period. The PPO plan had a significant decline in the low-risk category and an increase in the high-risk category, while the risk structure for the CDHP plan was virtually unchanged. We valued the change in the PPO risk at approximately an 8% increase in the risk of the PPO members. This suggests that the CDHP plan may have been more effective at helping participants manage existing or new medical conditions or health risks. As for costs, the data were clear. The HSA eligible plan ended up costing on average 15% less per capita than the PPO plan over the three-year period. We've performed this analysis for other employer clients with very similar results. 
We thank you for holding this hearing today to highlight how HSAs can indeed engage patients and bend the cost curve. I appreciate the opportunity to share these findings with the committee, and I'm pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Watts. Dr. Battelle, you are recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and other members of the committee. Uh, this is a great honor for me to be here on this side of the dais. I'm a former Senate staffer and a career in health policy, but I'm coming to you today kind of bringing all of those worlds together, and perhaps most importantly as someone who delivers care to over a thousand patients as part of a regular community-based primary care practice. And so that's actually where I start from. And the one thing I would ask you on this very important topic about bending the cost curve is to really consider what I would say should be all of our North Star, that is how do we make care better and less costly for all Americans? So that's where I come from. The majority of my patients are primarily insured by either Medicare or Medicaid, and do have commercial insurance as well. So I take care of kind of all gamuts. And I want to tell you about one specific patient just because she will ring true probably to all of you on some level. 47-year-old female, I did get her permission, not her name, but I'm going to share her story. 47-year-old female, actually works for the federal government, has a high deductible health plan and a health savings account, three children, uh, average income is about $63,000, and so she's right in that ballpark. She was unfortunately diagnosed with a very complex kidney cancer that fortunately has a very advanced immunotherapy that can actually target her cells, but costs about $150,000 um, per treatment. No question that this is something that I think American innovation has brought to her doorsteps. But she will regularly use this very advanced medical device with me, one of her 14 doctors, to try to understand what test does she really need? What is it that she can actually get on a weekly basis in order to make sure she can afford the very expensive drug that she absolutely must take, but then she'll sit and bargain with me over which labs test does she need, which doctor's visits does she need to go to? And these questions are exacerbated at the end of the month when she's looking to next month to think about paying for her rent and thinking about putting food on the table. And this is somebody with a health savings account. When I asked her, when I talked to her in preparing for this hearing, how does that HSA help you? And she said probably the most profound thing that I want all of you to take home. She said, it really doesn't matter whether I have an HSA or not. She said, I have to think about the money that I have to spend in that moment and what I have to do or not do in order to make that work for my finances. So I want everybody to kind of take a broader view and think about the growing cost of care and also what people do. They don't hear HSA or a pre-deductible they just think about the money that's being asked of them when they get the call from their pharmacy or when the person in my front office desk asks them for their payment at the time of service. And all of us have been to the doctor where we see that sign that says payment requested at the time of service. And that $20 adds up when you're dealing with these types of illnesses. So I come to you in that context and I think that the conversation around bending the cost curve is absolutely the right one to have. I just wanna make three points about the drivers of those costs. Number one, hospitals. Hospitals, one of whom I work for, hospitals have year over year had double digit cost increases. And these increases have been held constant no matter what your payer is. Number two, ambulatory services. Costs in ambulatory services, physician offices, have increased 71%. As a primary care doctor, I would tell you that's a good thing. We should be spending way more money in high value services, but we're not, we're spending them across the board. The third is prescription drugs. Prescription drugs from a recent Office of the Investig Inspector General report has grown at a proportion, and I'll just, one statistic that I'll actually read to you because it's startling, total reimbursement for all brand name drugs in Part D increased 77% from 2011 to 2015, despite a 17% decrease in the number of prescriptions for these drugs. So less actual prescriptions, higher actual reimbursement in Part D. These are not facts to be ignored. So these are three huge cost drivers. I've included some, uh, Senator Kennedy's time taught me that graphs are always wonderful to have, so I've got some graphs in my written testimony that illustrate some of this in, I hope, a very clear way. Those are three huge cost drivers. That's not to say that health savings accounts can't play an important role. Absolutely. 
um, innovative pro services like direct primary care, having access to chronic management services pre-deductible so that you don't even have to think about whether you need to spend an HSA on kind of higher value services, work that the University of Michigan has done to identify what's high value. Opioid treatment, for example, should not apply to your deductible. I don't care what you're doing. These are things that just make sense for everyday Americans, and we need to do more of that. We started some of that by making preventive services covered before deductibles in the Affordable Care Act. That was not enough. So. In closing, I just want to, I know that we'll get into a, hopefully an extensive kind of debate about health savings accounts and what fixes. Think about all of this as kind of a large balloon and think about the real people and the real voices, particularly of patients, as well as the doctors who are taking care of those patients who are just as frustrated. And I hope that we can have a more productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel, um, and uh, thanks for sharing the perspective of a physician and an actual patient that, uh, that you deal with. And uh, um, I remind all members we'll keep our, our questioning period timed uh, to five minutes, and I'll just begin. Um, we've really enjoyed the testimony, and I certainly by no means would recommend or say that uh, health care savings accounts would be a silver bullet or an answer to these challenging problems that we have across the board for the health care spending uh, here in the United States or for a lot of patients. Uh, but it is being proven to be widely utilized, uh, widely appreciated when you have the average, in income, uh, average income of folks that use these healthcare savings accounts, about $57,000, and they're becoming more popular. Um, but I'm more interested in how they actually affect bending the cost curve a little bit. Um, I know that one of the, uh, the challenges we have in healthcare today is that uh, healthcare payments are ending up being made essentially by a third party and not by the patient. So often physicians, often patients uh, don't know what the cost is uh, when, uh, when they're not able to compare or they're not aware in terms of utilizing uh, what healthcare services to use. So you've got somebody spending other, uh, somebody else spending money um, uh, and they may not spend it as wisely as they would spend their own, uh, for instance. So these consumer-directed healthcare uh, accounts have successfully addressed some of those challenges. So maybe Dr. Atlas, I'll just start with you. Can you elaborate maybe a little bit on how um, or maybe explain to us some of the ways in which these consumer-directed health plans have allowed consumers with their own, you know, their own skin in the game, essentially, a little bit, to help be put more in the driver's seat and make the right informed consumer choices. And, and how does that actually, how has it helped to bend the cost curve a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you can look at, uh, we at Hoover, and I'm trying to be uh, part of what the person who down the hall from me had his office, which was Milton Friedman, uh, spoke quite a bit from evidence. And when you look at the evidence in the published literature on people who have the information necessary to make decisions and have a uh, health savings account, high deductible type plan, the price of care comes down significantly. We look at published studies, I mentioned them very quickly, uh, on MRI, on outpatient ambulatory surgery. These are in the literature. Uh, and we see that the prices came down 18, 19% per year. Of course, this is very true uh, what uh, uh, minority uh, member uh, Mr. Heinrich said, which is that uh, the information has to be there. And so in these studies, patients had visibility of price. The question really is, is there legislation necessary to do that? Because we really don't do that in other goods and services. Uh, you don't have to say to the computer store, uh, you know, uh, you better show your prices. The fact is that the most compelling reason for doctors and hospitals to post their prices would be knowing that they're competing for patients' money. When patients care what they're, what they're spending, they're going to save money. And this is not an assertion, it's proven in the literature. We can also look back at things that weren't covered at all by insurance. So here I'm talking about MRI, whole body CTs, uh, whole body MRI screening, and I'm a neuroradiologist, so I'm very familiar with what happened. When that came out, it was $1,500 to $2,000 in the shopping mall. And within a year or two, the prices came down to $300. Now, that's not the only reason was that patients were paying, but that's a critical part. There's a value-seeking behavior that is completely missing from the equation here. So it's factually proven that when the prices are visible and when signs of quality are visible, which they would be once you have a competitive environment, the prices come down significantly. And this is, this, the key point here is it's not just the prices for the people who have the health savings account. We want health savings accounts as a vehicle to reduce the prices of medical care 
while avoiding the way other countries do this, which is by limiting access to care. This way, it's really consumer-driven, to use the uh, phrase that you're using, yeah. and that is the way to get prices down without impacting quality negatively. Maybe, Ms. Watts, you can explain a little bit or, or follow up on that from the employer side of the equation, who have a lot of employees that may utilize these accounts. I mean, what have you seen in terms of employers benefiting you know, from these types of consumer-driven plans themselves in terms of costs and... So access to tools and resources are key to the success of these programs, and in particular, even the one that I talked about. So you've got your design and the incentive, if you will, to have the skin in the game. But um, it is true, consumers feel very well, very ill-equipped to be able to shop for their health care. And so, you know, tools exist that provide transparency information. But the truth is, right now, only about 30% of your medical care that you would um, be seeking is shoppable, where you could find out the price, do um, comparative um, 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 research for what the prices are. For, for most, for everything else, it's too complex, there's too many parties involved to be able to know exactly what something's going to cost. And so one of the things that employers have done are to add um, what they call um, advocates for the consumer. And it might be within the health plan or it may be a third party that helps that um, patient um, navigate the health care delivery system. So, you know, I got this diagnosis, I'm a little scared, should I be getting another opinion somewhere else? Um, is this the type of thing that maybe we want to send this off to a panel of doctors to take a look at because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and, you know, because there's this combination not only of knowing what the price is and shopping based on price, but also knowing, you know, what is the quality of the provider that you're going to be going to? Are they best equipped to be able to help you get the outcome that you're looking for the fastest? Thank you. All right. Senator Heinrich, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Dr. Patel, I it's evident from this hearing, and uh, I've experienced this in the past, that policymakers love high deductibility insurance plans. Uh, I can assure you my constituents do not. <laughs> um, the other feedback I get from them is that high deductibility plans cause them, cause them to forego treatment at times. Is that something you've seen in your practice? Yes, Senator. So it's very routine. Go to any kind of community-based or even hospital-based uh, practice where you have a high volume of patients. We all know the phenomenon of having people like, you know, try to seek care or plan out their year to try to understand when and how they will hit their deductible. And it is a very common phenomenon to have patients actually space out services that they need and many of my patients, I can tell when the fall cycle hits or when we get into the new year and they're more susceptible to that annual deductible, they will not come in. And so there's a very conscious decision. And I think it speaks to something that I've seen over a decade of practicing. We talk about wage growth. I have not seen, and I can say I have now treated, I tried to tally, I've taken care of about 22,000 patients of all types. And I have yet to hear somebody say, you know, I got into that high deductible health plan and I'm making more money as a result of it. So yeah, I'm at, waiting at, for that constituent. I am too. I'm waiting for that patient to tell me that. Now, that's not to say that that's happening, but my experience has been that, and, and then the data that we're seeing is showing that people are foregoing that care. My former employer, the Rand Corporation, ran something called the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, which actually illustrated that depending on where you put that deductible, people will forego necessary care. And that's exactly where I think, as stewards of the American economy, we need to be careful. Absolutely. We don't want people running to the doctor every time they have a cold, but we sure want them running to the doctor when they have uh, indications of, of serious illness. Um, the first chart in your written testimony shows the cost of prescription drugs growing dramatically faster than other health care costs. It's the, the very steep line here in your in your chart. And frankly, I hear more about that than anything else in health care. No questions asked. What policy should Congress be looking at to lower the skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs? Absolutely. And it's it's certainly not simple. I, I was in the Senate when we were launching and designing the Part D program. 
I would argue that the Part D program in 2006 does not reflect the innovation in American medicine that can be made available in the Part D program in 2018. So one essential, and I would hope that it's a bipartisan, it, this is not a partisan issue, it's a bipartisan issue, modernize the Medicare Part D program in order to bring the very innovations that we have in Medicare Parts A and Parts B to actually do that in Part D. Right now, we have no ability for plans to bring any of the innovative tools or things that we've done to manage services in other parts of the program. That's one. Number two, better access to generics and biosimilars. You are hearing that not only does the Trump administration kind of agree with that, but many health policy experts uh, also feel like that's doable. Number three is a very direct conversation. It's what Dr. Atlas had referred to about kind of a direct conversation about transparency, and that's transparency in all the levels between the manufacturer, the um, pharmaceutical benefit manager, uh, the pharmacy, and mm -hmm. the person who it really impacts, the consumer, at the end. I, I think that's a, it's an area of commonality here what, that I hear is, uh, is transparency um, is key to people making good decisions. And, and Dr. Atlas, you said this very eloquently. You said when the prices are visible. And it seems to me that's one of the challenges here. And we seem to agree that transparency is a good thing. And when people are given more information, they make better choices. It's really hard, myself included, and, and almost anyone I talk to, that's not the lay of the land in our healthcare system today. Dr. Atlas, how do we, how do we make that change and require more transparency in the system? I, I think this is really a critical point, and I think we do all agree that this is necessary. Uh, first, I want to talk about drugs and price transparency, because this is the biggest offender of all, uh, because uh, you know recent data shows that there were $179 billion in these very complicated arrangements with pharmacy benefit managers, patients have no idea what the price of their drug is. But the real reason they have no idea is because just like me, when I get my high cholesterol drug, I pay $2. I don't, I don't care what the price is if I'm only paying $2. And this is the problem when you have an insurance model or any program that minimizes to near zero or to relatively speaking near zero what you pay for something. In fact, I'm sure that everybody here is aware of the study that came out uh, very recently uh, that over 20% of patient co-pays for drugs, when they're using insurance, their co-pay is larger than if they paid for the entire drug out of pocket mm. because there are contractual agreements that muzzle pharmacists from saying the prices of care of the drug if they paid out of their pocket. I mean, this is unconscionable and scandalous, yeah. but this is an example of the perversion of the system when patients don't know what things cost. So the question really is, how do you get that to occur uh, and have them care what it costs? It's not just the visibility, because if the prices were visible, but they really didn't care, they didn't get a reward for paying less, okay, fine, I know the price. So they need to be able to get a positive incentive to pay less because it's not necessarily the same. When you say someone forgoes medical care, the question isn't that, the question is necessary medical care. And when you really look at the data in the literature, and Haviland is an, is an author of one of the studies, she showed that the patients did forego medical care, but they did not get harmful health effects by foregoing that medical care. So if you really, you have to look at the data and be careful and not mix up the uh, kind of uh, activity here. It's a very difficult problem, particularly with drugs, because it's so complicated to get prices there. But as one of my colleagues told me, if you just mandate and legislate that prices have to be posted, it could be like hotel rooms where on the back of the, the door you see the price and the price is meaningless. No one even looks at it, no one cares. You have to be far more thoughtful about how you get the prices visible, and I think it's by demand from patients who care what they spend. Okay, Ms. Representative Handel, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, much uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses today. I appreciate it. It's been a very good dialogue. I want to stay on the topic of transparency and come to you, Mr. Uh, McKechnie. Um, the HSAs are designed to encourage consumers, patients to shop around for health services, and we've heard a lot of conversation about whether that's easy to do or hard to do. Um, there are some new services companies out there, uh, Metabid, Zendi Health, Healthcare Blue Book, 
um, that are working very hard to make it easier. In fact, I've availed myself of one of those, I won't say which one, obviously, um, to check the prices of mammograms. And it is stunning, the broad array of pricing on it. And to, but no one would know that unless they actually picked up the phone and called each of those and said, if I come in and pay cash, how much would it be? Um, so can you speak to the services that these companies offer and whether you think that's a good way to go or do we need legislation to really drive and foster transparency? We think obviously, and thank you for your question, first of all, we think obviously uh, the reason there's a request for legislation is because perhaps some of the other methodologies have yet to work. And they'll be working whether or not legislation is passed in the first place. That's the nature of consumerism. Right. They tend to work best, as Ms. Watts said, in that 30% where visibility tends to be around non-emergency services, which is why the companies you described can tell you where and when you can get an MRI and for how much money. They're very good at that kind of diagnostic-centric price transparency function. And when you look at a bank's HSA platform and their web uh, pre web representation of that service, you can see that all of those things are plugged in to help people do exactly what we've been describing here today, which is take their dollars, find their treatment choice or the one that's been prescribed to them by their doctor, and then where's the most efficient way to spend their uh, scarce resources in the time that's important to them? And I think that's one of those qualitative questions that you miss frequently, which is not just that you need a service or it's been insured and therefore it's inefficient, which is very important and I agree with, but also it needs to be available to you, the essence of consumerism. When do you want to do it and with whom do you want to do it? And that choice is yours to make and services you describe make them easier. Transparency would be achievable more easily with legislation since you would have to do it. Okay. And so we support that. Right. Um, it, it's a shame though, because the, the point of the story is everything should be transparent and it's not. That's right. Thank you very much. Dr. Atlas, you uh, mentioned briefly in your testimony um, that policy priorities over the past few years have really been focused more on, I think you called it the insurance model or lowering the cost of health insurance rather than focusing more on lowering the actual cost of health care. Can you just expand on that a little bit more? Because I think that's a very important uh, differentiation there and a very important point. Right. Uh, thank you. When you uh, subsidize insurance premiums, which is what the Affordable Care Act essentially did, or when you give refundable tax credits, which is essentially cash to, pay, to people, like uh, a lot of the Republican proposals uh, were proposing, all you're doing is literally propping up the price of the good. In this case, the good is insurance. And when you do that, you're forgetting about the fact that the driver of the cost of insurance, the main driver, is the payout for medical services. At least historically, it's been roughly 80-20, uh, 20, 20 being administrative mm -hmm. uh, or, or other things. Uh, and there are some good actuarial estimates that say that the price, as you know, of insurance premiums went significantly higher under Affordable Care Act. And it's estimated that about 90% of the increase is due to regulations, not the cost of medical care. So that's sort of an outlier in this. Uh, so the, the key here is to understand what's really the driver of insurance premiums. It's the cost of care. That's the root problem. And the way to solve that, as, as we're all, uh, or at least uh, I think the gist of this is, is to have exposure and not, I don't like to use skin in the game, but I just like to say caring about the costs of what you're buying. This is the only good or service that you don't know what it costs till after you've used it. Okay, and even when you get the bill, it's indecipherable, particularly in Medicare. I want to make one additional point about the idea that higher deductibles, first of all, it's not a panacea. It's not for everyone, and I don't think anyone is saying that. But the reality is that everyone benefits from other people having them, even the, the uh, pe people who don't have them themselves. And if we look at what happened, which I have in a chart in what I submitted in writing here, under the Affordable Care Act, it's true that all insurance prices went up, but the fact is that high deductible premiums selectively went up faster than everything else, even though people still buy them more than they did in the past. And so the economist friends of mine at Hoover said, well, how could that be? If your data shows that the prices selectively went up faster for high deductible care uh, premiums, why would, they, why would more people buy it? It's because it's still cheaper. Okay, so, but the problem is that it was selectively punished. It's the exact opposite 
that you would want to legislate. People are voting by their actions for the value of HSAs and high deductible plans. You look at the curves, there are record numbers, 22 to 30 some million, depending upon what estimate, of people have HSAs, and increasing employers are offering, and people are, they want them. Even in the models where there are multiple companies that have uh, so-called exchanges, people, when they were given a defined amount of money to use on health benefits, they opted more for high deductible plans. It's not true that people don't want them. They Sorry do. Sorry to interrupt. I'm out of time. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. And uh, Mr. McKechnie, let me ask you this question, because Indiana has been cited as a model um, in, in many respects, uh, uh, particularly because of their state employees. But can you talk a little bit more about the success we've seen in Indiana or what changes, if any, there have been in Indiana's success since 2010? Um, can you comment on any lessons that have been learned from other states' approaches uh, in sure. implementing HSAs? I think it's important to understand the landscape here, which is that um, in 2008, in that presidential election, Medicaid covered slightly more than 50 million people. Uh, and by the time we got to election 2016, Medicaid covered slightly less than 75 million people, 74 million people. And so the Affordable Care Act is largely responsible for that growth. But of course, it left the states with the question of how do you want to expand? And Indiana took up, uh, took up the Affordable Care Act's challenge and said, yes, we want to expand, but we want to expand by having an account-based system where it made sense to do so. And so their system had traditional Medicaid, of course, but it also allowed for what they call Indiana power accounts and what is called the HIP 2.0 program. And of course, most of your current officials at CMS were former Indiana officials, so they know exactly what they're talking about and can enhance uh, whatever answer you might need on this question. But it goes like this. The marketing for Medicaid 2.0 was, uh, HIP 2.0 was so successful, the program had to be closed. Mm. And that, that enrollment shut down in that first year because people, it turns out, at the lower end of the economic spectrum, aren't illiterate when it comes to finance, did want to have money in an account, did want to see portability, were happy to trade preventive care services for getting $1,100 in their account again next year. And we think that's a very salutary benefit for teaching people how to use financial instruments. Uh, we spent a lot of money at the American Bankers Association trying to promote financial literacy. The governor actually did it in Medicaid and should be congratulated for it. Hmm. It doesn't exist too many places. So it's going well. There are some problems, however. It, obviously, nothing's perfect. And one of the imperfections is that as people move in and out of jobs and in and out of Medicaid, that's a very significant complexity to have to manage. And the average is not Medicare, where you age into it and you're there forever. This is the kind of thing where you earn out of Medicaid eligibility, and you may fall back into the program, and there are integration problems with what happens at that moment. So they, they're working on it, trying to make that as more seamless. But that's one of the issues, sir. Okay. Let me ask a question, and anyone can answer, but you know, you've got a lot of different consumer-directed health plans. You've got HSAs, you've got flexible spending accounts, you've got health reimbursement accounts. I mean, any thoughts on which of those might be best that are showing track record of actually, you know, helping lower costs or what might be best for average Americans? I mean, it's always individualized for individual folks, but any, any thoughts? I mean, I'll just, just say, run, I'll run share a factoid with you. Sure. So of the consumer directed plans, the account based plans, um, about 77% of them are HSA plans, the remaining are HRA plans. And those HRA plans are really more legacy plans because that's what we had first. Um, we did, you know, people put in consumer directed plans to begin with with an HRA and then we got the health savings accounts. And so most employers today, their consumer directed plan is an HSA based plan. Got it. I would just add, I, I think it's very important that all of these accounts are shifted into ones that people actually own rather than are dependent on their employer, mm -hmm. and that they don't have this use it or lose it phenomenon at the end, which of course HSAs do not. This is really critical. In fact, it should be easy. And well, I have flexible a chart. spending accounts would, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. but but the reality is, I'm not sure why there's a need for different types mm -hmm. because they all have should be liberalized in their uses okay. and rules and things like that. So I think that's uh, it's really there's some certain things that are again incentives. There's an incentive to save if you don't u lose it. There's also an incentive to save if you're going to be able to pass it on in a tax-sheltered way, as opposed to just your spouse, which is now uh, one of the rules, or use it for your elderly parents or someone else, uh, even if it's an individual account. There's, there's a lot of things to be done that make them more attractive and more valuable to you. 
Dr. Patel, have you seen other patients uh, from experience, you know, they have to use it or lose it on a flexible spending account versus maybe an HSA? Just Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. And I, I do think that the everyday yeah. American does not actually understand HSAs and FSAs mm -hmm. as well. I think they're offered these choices during mm -hmm. the enrollment period, and then they just kind of pick, and they're not necessarily mm -hmm. at the time of enrollment kind of savvy about what they're doing. And I would add one more category, Mr. Chairman, pre-deductible coverage. Think about how mm -hmm. much we spend on tax dollars to allow employers to offer right. kind of these benefits. Think about just really kind of honing in on kind of what's you know necessary care and thinking about pre-deductible coverage. And I'll just make one little comment about the Healthy Indiana Plan because I think it's important to just level set. I, I go back to my days as a health services researcher. There were over 500,000 people that were eligible. 55% of the people for the power accounts n either missed a payment or never made the first payment. And 14% of those eligible never enrolled. Nine in 10 of those people that were actually in those power accounts actually ended up falling to that lower tier. So while people talk about it as a success and some might say it's a failure, the truth is that there's a lot more work to be done before you think about HSAs and Medicaid. Sure, good. So, Senator Heiner, quick, nice for five minutes. For, uh, for every time I hear about HSAs, I hear 10 times about premium inflation, obviously, and premiums are projected to increase by about 15% next year, at least according to CBO. Um, Dr. Patel, do you have uh, an opinion on how the Trump administration's actions with regard to undermining the individual markets affect those premiums over time? Well, I think the critical, yes, I do have an opinion. I, I think that premium costs, unfortunately, in the current administration, there has been an interpretation that this is all just benefit inflation that's driving the premium costs. And therefore, if we release people from kind of these requirements around kind of essential health benefits, et cetera, that somehow magically will offer these better value plans and therefore they will be cheaper and that'll bring down premiums. Unfortunately, by changing some of the rules around what plans must or the way they can offer benefits, you're actually creating a kind of a two-tiered system where if people know that they're going to have to deal with chronic illnesses like the patient I talked about, there is no universe where she's going to try to get one of these less generous plans. That's just, that's simple math. So the critical question is how are we without getting into, I realize the word mandate and all these things are just toxic politically, but what we really need to do is have an honest conversation about mm -hmm. what are the services and valuable benefits within the care delivery system that we must have coverage for and then what are the things that we really need to have people drive away from? And, and that's the places where you, I, I know that she had to leave, but when you talk about the cost of mammogram, I can go within one mile and find a mammogram that's 10 times the cost, and I can find something that's a couple hundred dollars. So how do we get at that issue? And that's certainly not being addressed in the current administration. HSAs are premised on consumers' ability to shop around for the, the best value. And, and certainly, you know, I've found that for my upper income constituents, um, and New Mexico tends to be on the lower end of the overall curve. But for people making over $100,000 a year, they, they, have a lot of, um, they have a lot of value. But my rural constituents oftentimes don't have any ability to shop around. I mean, they're really captive of whatever infrastructure is left in, in rural America. Um, is there, what, it, what is, the, um, what is the, the HSA value for them? Is it just primarily the fact that you might, uh, it, the, the tax benefit, but do you lose the, the ability to impact the overall system when you can't choose between providers, for, really for any of you? Mr. Oh, well, I'd, be happy, to, I'd yeah. be happy to try and answer. I'm not sure that's a HSA specific question. And I know the country is going through a discussion about the availability of uh, providers in by county and insurers mm -hmm. by county. And so leaving aside the question of HSAs for a moment, I can understand, and I've had the privilege of working with some of the members of New Mexico's state legislature, Carol Lavelle particularly, uh, in this uh, topic area. As we come to the HSA question, a uh, gentleman actually responded, I believe, to you uh, from our board 
addressing that exact issue, which is not necessarily where you live in the state, but where are you on the economic spectrum? Because the question of how do you satisfy that first thousand dollars of obligation is a very important one. Yeah. And not everybody has a thousand dollars, and we recognize that too. But if you're going to pay a thousand dollars, and the tax rates vary between 15 and 40 percent for income, is it a thousand one hundred and fifty dollars that you owe? Is it fourteen hundred dollars that you owe? And how are those any better than owing simply a thousand dollars? And so on that issue, I imagine we can just leave that aside now. The point having been made, but uh, I think you're right. If there isn't anybody <laughs> around the corner from you to go and get treated, I'm not sure that's an insurance question. I think that's probably something much more difficult to answer. Can I just comment? Yeah, um, we co-authored a paper, Mercer, with the American Benefits Council on employer innovations in healthcare, and I believe one of the case studies in there is um, one of our, our ABC member companies that is a rural company um, in the coal industry, and they have access issues for their employees, and they've actually done direct contracting with some providers, and some of the care that they provide is virtual health care mm -hmm. because people yeah, don't absolutely. have access. And so I think one of the things to think about is, you know, somebody said this isn't just an HSA issue that's really just more of a funding vehicle and it and it does get people to have skin in the game the, the real issue is access but we are on the verge of having such a open door to access no matter where you are and I think having people understand the value and being able to make those decisions I, I would agree with, with you wholeheartedly with the exception of one issue is it, it to have that world exist we actually have to have the infrastructure to be able to access telemedicine and virtual medicine in those rural areas. And I will tell you that there are vast areas of this country where the, uh, um, the broadband access, the uh, infrastructure to make that happen, which I think you would find Republicans and Democrats both agree is a mm -hmm. great change to our healthcare system, does not actually exist. Could I add one quick comment on Real the quick. telemedicine exactly. issue, which is Real that this is another anti-competitive problem in the, in the MD world, which is that states have their own licensure of doctors, and that prevents, in addition to other rules, prevents active telemedicine mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually limits competition. And this is a problem. I want to thank everyone uh, for taking the time to testify today. This has been great. Um, unfortunately, we had some members who were confined to some other important hearings and issues, uh, uh, particularly on the House side. Uh, so we will, I want to make sure that we know that uh, members that wish to submit questions for the record, uh, the hearing record will remain open for three business days and you may anticipate some uh, opportunity to respond in writing as well uh, from some of those members who are unable to attend. And thank you again and with that uh, the committee is adjourned.